Say what? Wingless moths? Believe it or not, you are currently looking at a species of moth that barely has wings at all. Now, before some people go, actually, they do have wings. They are just vestigial wings. Yeah, that's true, that's true. They do have wings, they're just reduced. Let me tell you more about them. My name is Bart Coppens and I am fascinated by moths that have lost their ability to fly. They are effectively almost wingless. Why and how? Good question. I'm going to explain to you all there is to know about this really cool and weird species today in this new episode of Moth Cycles. Let's start the intro! We have an emergency, people. We have an emergency. Somebody has sent me moth eggs by the mail. And they decided to put the eggs in dental sticks container. But upon inspection, the, the small caterpillars are already hatching inside the container. Can you see it? These are small caterpillars hatching from their eggs. So they've been hatched during transit, that's an emergency. That's a big emergency, so immediately we must prepare their container. On the bottom, I will lay some paper towel to absorb the moisture. Maple, cherry, oak tree, oak tree, some of their favorite foods. This pieces will eat almost anything. The babies are babies of the vaporer moth, by the way. So there you go, I'm just gonna put all of them in here. Ooh. And let's hope that they will start feeding. In fact, there's so many small caterpillars in this container, I'm gonna have to put the whole container in. Because I'm, I'm sure I cannot get all of them out of there myself, so they'll have to walk from there to their food. Now, phew, let's start the intro and see how they are doing. All right, people, so how are our vapor moths doing? Let's take a look. Yeah, this is an Asian technique ca called taking a look using our eyes. It's an ancient Chinese technique from a thousand years old. Oh. Wow, so many little caterpillars. Alright, so clearly people, these caterpillars have a huge appetite. And they've eaten a lot of leaf already. In particular they seem to be enjoying oak tree and sweet gum. But these caterpillars will eat almost anything. Wow, adorable. 
I like uh, caterpillars of the genus Orgia. I think it's a fascinating genus and I definitely want to have more species of them on my channel. Earlier this year I did the Scars Vapor Moth episode on that species, don't know if you've seen it. A few days later... Uh-oh. Me makey a mistakey. Ew. I let the insides of the container grow moldy. And now it's full of rotting plant. This is an amateur level mistake. And if this species was any other species than the vapor moth, this would be the end. If you do this, this mistake with pretty much any sensitive species, you just successfully wiped all of your own caterpillars out. But thankfully, this is not just the average caterpillar, this is the vapor moth. And the vapor moth is simply almost indestructible. In captivity, they can deal with a dirty container, a dirty environment, High humidity, low humidity, heat, cold, doesn't matter. Anything you throw at them, they'll survive. And I'll have to remove the so survivors from these disgusting rotting leaves. And place them in a clean container. I'm so sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not sure, but I just forgot about them for a few days too long. Believe it or not, I make mistakes too, it's embarrassing. Uh, thankfully this was not a, a really rare or sensitive species. This, would, if you, this mistake is a fatal mistake if you do it with some species. Uh, it just totally slipped my mind. It totally slipped my mind, it was really stupid. Let's put them in here. Ew, it's all rotten. That's disgusting. I'm so sorry. By a miracle, all of them are alive. So disgusting. Look at this rotting mess. There's fungus everywhere. I can't believe I made this newbie level mistake. It's really stupid of me. Look, it's all rotting. This is really an amateur level mistake. I'm shocked. Wow. I rarely make a mistake like this, but even I can be forgetful about moths. Let's rescue the caterpillar from this mess. Alright uh, people, this was a little bit of an embarrassing situation. I forgot to clean the food of my caterpillars for a few days and it started to rot. Yikes. That's embarrassing for somebody that a lot of people on the internet consider to be an expert. Am I really an expert? I don't know and I don't care. Expert is just a label. I don't think there's anybody in the world who is flawless. But it is embarrassing nonetheless. And I even considered like... Uh, maybe cutting this part of... Uh, of the breeding, cutting it out of my video so my viewers cannot see that this happened. But then I was like, mm, no, 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 I think it's more realistic to show my viewers everybody. Yes, even me, I make mistakes. Mistakes happen. Sometimes you're forgetful and you forget to clean your, clean your animals or you screw up. Um, as a pet owner, that's generally not a good thing, especially if there's animals dependent on your care. But uh, yeah, it, it happens. It, uh, we're all human, I guess. And uh, hmm, it's kind of weird. I, I rarely make these terrible mistakes um, when I'm breeding moths. Like forgetting to, to clean the container so for so long it starts to, to rot and grow moldy. Yeah, that's a, that's a big, you know, a high level of a mistake. <laughs> Stupid me, I'm just so forgetful. 
But we can learn from mistakes even when we are a little bit embarrassed and that's what will improve us as a breeder if we learn from mistakes. So I'm gonna leave this in the video. I'm going to show you that I make a mistake. I make a mistake. I'm honest about it, people. I'm honest. The good news is all the caterpillars seem fine. That's because this species is a really strong species in captivity. Even horrible conditions, they will survive. It's, it's hard to kill this species. They are really, really easy. So I was lucky that it happened to one of my easiest species. Um, and these vapor moth caterpillars are simply unkillable. So yeah, we are still in the game and they're looking really cute. All right, hopefully now they will be better. A mistake like this would have killed any other species. Yes, Bart Coppens makes mistakes too. Thankfully, this is a really hardy species, so it's difficult to kill them even if you tried. As morbid as that sounds, let's learn from our mistakes and move on. I kept the container too humid. Thankfully, most of our babies survived and continue the journey of growing into beautiful moths. When the caterpillars grow bigger, they do assume a crazy appearance. Eventually, with bizarre tufts of hair that will envelop them, all they need is fresh food and a safe space to grow in peace. Eventually, they will need an upgrade in space and I would move them to an even bigger enclosure. I upgraded them from a tiny plastic box to a bigger insect cage that they can live in. A few days later... I do wonder how our vapor and moths are doing, therefore I'm going to take a look. Let's take a look inside, shall we? Oh wow! Yeah, this is cool. Wow, now that sure is something. Look at the crazy appearance of these babies right now. This is why I love vapor moths. The, the diversity of species of them and the colorful caterpillars makes them quite charismatic. Something to keep in mind, however, is that vapor moth species and their relatives can be terrible invasive species. This species is thankfully native to my own country, the Netherlands, so breeding them in captivity is not harmful for the environment, even if they escape. They are very common in the village where I live. But if you are an insect breeder that is considering importing eggs of exotic species that are foreign to your country, please be reluctant. Orgia species can be terribly invasive species in some instances, and they are relatives of the famous gypsy moths. They can eat hundreds of host plants and survive in a wide range of climates. This is not a species you should risk importing to countries where it is not native. It's important to think of the ethical aspects of breeding moths in captivity. Make sure it is always legal and make sure it is always ethical and that you don't breed species that can threaten the environment if they escaped. In this case, I am doing it safely because they are native to my area. Wow, ladies and gentlemen, the caterpillars of vapor moths are generally incredible. They're one of my favorite species to breed because of their crazy color and forms. Just look at them. Isn't that insane? There's many species of vapor and moths. Some are common, some are very, very rare. It's my goal to breed some of the rare ones too in the future. Just look at their crazy forms and shape. They're like tiny little dragons, are they not? 
Wow. Really cool. Let's check back a few days later and see how they've grown. All right, folks, let's carefully open it to see how they are doing now. Oh dear, we have to be careful. There's so many of them everywhere. So thankfully, this is a native species. Uh, and if some of them happen to escape, it's not going to be a disaster. But of course, we do prefer to um, to keep them unharmed. Okay, so let's carefully take this whole circus out. Oh man, it's so difficult. The caterpillars are going to drop themselves to the ground. Um, give me a moment to get all of this out, all right? Ladies and gentlemen, oh my God. Just look at that, oh my God. The breeding of this species has gone incredibly well. Just look at how many crazy caterpillars we have right now. It's a whole army of them. Check them out. Wow. That's one of the most successful rearings I did this year. Granted, this species is not incredibly difficult, but still, raising so many of them is serious work. Just look at that. Caterpillar army much. Wow. Beautiful. Wow! Personally, I think that caterpillars from the genus of Orgia, the tussock moths, sorry, vaporer moths, are really fascinating creatures. There's many species of them too. I forgot how many species there are. But um, a few months ago I checked the whole list of how many there are described. And there's dozens of them. Now, be, please be careful if you breed them, because they can be invasive if introduced to new environments. This species is native to my country, that's why I'm handling them outdoors, I'm not very concerned with them escaping. But if you breed an exotic species, please keep them in quarantine indoors, don't take them outdoors like this. Because they, just like the gypsy moth, they have potential to, uh, to swarm and become harmful, invasive in some places. But of course, I'm doing everything legally and these are native species that I acquired legally. So this is not a threat to the environment. In fact, I, f I find these species in my village very often. But my dear God, this is such an amazing result. I'm quite pleased with myself right now. I don't want all of them to crawl away, so maybe I can distract some of them with food if I put some willow on top of it. Hopefully they'll crawl to the fresh juicy leaves that they want to eat. Meanwhile, I noticed their enclosure has a nice surprise for me in the form of cocoons! Yay! Some of them already pupated. Let me collect some of those. So the cocoons of tussock moths are quite simple. Um, that's because they don't spend that much time in the cocoon. I think the pupation time is like two to three weeks. You have to be careful when pulling them off though, because the pupa can be soft. Let's very gently remove some of the cocoons. Oh, here we have a pre-pupal caterpillar. Don't worry, it will pupate just fine. Let's see if some of them are already pupa. Yep, they are. Let's just harvest some of these and inspect them. See what's inside. It's time to place some of the caterpillars back before they all escape and start swarming. Let's put some of you guys back into your enclosure. I'm going to be honest, people. 
Uh, after handling so many caterpillars at once, I do feel a little bit itchy right now. And that's when I found out the hairs of this species can be mildly irritating. If you have allergies, okay? Don't breed this species. They're not very dangerous, but I think if you're allergic to some insect venoms or irritations, it's better not to test your luck. Let's collect some more cocoons then. They'll hatch in about two weeks time. Now what is unusual and cool about this species are the pupa. Here you can see the pupa of a male, but the female pupa are at least three times as big in weight and maybe size. Difference, huh? Now right now the pupa are white green because they are fresh but over time they will turn dark. But here you can see on the right side two huge female pupa and on the left two small male pupa. The males of this species are really pathetically small compared to the females. And the females are really exciting for they don't have functional wings. The wings of these females have more or less been reduced to useless stumps. And the females are more or less a walking abdomen with legs. Now I've done another episode before on an Orgia species, uh, so it's actually the second time I'm showing you, if you've watched all my uploads that is. So I guess most of you are not going to be that shocked at this fact anymore, still it's unique life cycle of a pretty bizarre species. That's cool, huh? To hatch the pupa of really small species I like to make these uh, small improvised container with paper towel on the edges. You can spray the paper towel to make it moist and the water retention is awesome. So I'm gonna place some of the pupa in here, carefully, that we collected. Um, this is just a small amount of our pupa, we have like 100 caterpillars that is still eating. But um, yeah, now we can take a closer look. Look at that. Such interesting pupa, don't you think? Now, the Orgia species, in my opinion, are really interesting. There are so many species of them. And on my channel, uh, it's my mission to raise a lot of interesting Orgia species for you guys. Because their caterpillars are adorable and really charming and cute. And it's a good addition to my channel. To learn about their biology and their behaviors. It's very, uh, very educational stuff, in my opinion. What you have to do now, <coughs> sorry, is wait about two weeks for them to come out. It doesn't take very long with this species. Their pupa stage is usually, if you keep them warm, two weeks, sometimes maybe three weeks, that's it. While many moths have been spinning cocoons, some of the last caterpillars are still feeding. Some of their brothers and sisters grew much faster than these slow-growing ones, but that's fine, and it's normal. They will catch up eventually. One of the moths has finally come out. Are you ready to see it? I bet you are excited. Let's do the big reveal! Ladies and gentlemen, something really cool has happened. I opened a container of our vapor moths. Most of them are pupa. But look what happened. Our first female has come out, yay! This is our first vapor moth. Wow. Let me adjust the camera a little bit, sorry. A little bit more. Come on camera. Give me a nice, ah, there you go. Now, Come on, camera, zoom for me. The females of this species are utterly bizarre because, as you can see, 
The females' rings are reduced to little stumps. Females are almost wingless. She's basically a walking abdomen with legs, and that's it. Very freaky biology. I bet most of you guys have not seen a wingless moth before. Wow, that's so weird. Seeing moths without wings, I never get used to it. Well, keep in mind she does have wings, I don't know if you can see the tiny stumps here. These tiny white things here, that's, that's what's left of the wings. Basically they are completely reduced to almost nothing. That's so crazy, huh? Who would have imagined? It's like a bean with legs. So weird. Now, this female is single because she is the first to come out of the pupa. Which is strange because normally the males are faster growing. And normally the males are the first to come out before the females. So it's a bit rare for the first specimens to be female. I guess it was just a really fast growing female. But that's okay that she's single because this species is very common in my area. So what I do is I will place the female here on a stick. And I will place the stick in my garden. And if we wait and the wind will carry her pheromone, She's going to attract a male that's going to mate with her. If you don't believe me, check this out. So what I will do is I will place a stick in the ground. There you go. And next I will take the female and I will place her on the stick. Yeah. Oops. She fell. Let's try that again. She's very clumsy when it comes to walking. Come on, just grab onto the stick, will you? There you go. Really? Silly creature. Don't make me try it again. She's very heavy, so she may have problem clinging to the stick. There you go. Uh. Finally, she's secure. So what we do now is wait. I place the female here on the stick. And if we wait, she's going to produce pheromone. And the smell will probably attract a male who's going to mate with her. A male from the wild. Wow, that was fast. It took less than 10 minutes. This species is so common in my garden this year. If I place a female outdoors, a male will arrive almost immediately to pair with her. They are very sensitive to the smell of females. As you can see, the males of this species are quite normal. They have functional wings and large antennae. It's just the females that are freaks in this case. The pairing doesn't last very long and the males leave in about 20 to 40 minutes. Then the female is fertilized and will be ready to lay a lot of fertilized eggs. She can lay hundreds of them. Do you see this thing that the females are doing with their butt? That's them releasing pheromones. Females have glands in their abdomen and sometimes you can clearly see when she's trying to call the males. This is basically the moth equivalent of a booty call.
Wow, something is hatching. It's one of my own males, it seems. You've already seen what the males look like, but that was a wild one. This is the one I raised. The first thing that the males do after hatching is climb up and inflate their wings. It takes a while for him to pump them up. However, slowly but surely, you can see his wings expand. Here is a fun fact. Butterflies and moths pump up their wings by pumping their body fluid through the hollow wing veins. Gravity helps them in this process, which is why they have to hang. The pressure of their body fluid inflates the wings and helps them retain their permanent shape. Afterward, the fluid flows back into their bodies and the wings dry out and become stiff and hard. After that, the moth will be able to fly. There you go. I'll finish now. The males of this species have two bright white spots on their forewings and are beautifully chocolatey brown color. Personally, I think these moths are really pretty, even if they aren't super colorful. Vapor moths are highly interesting animals, and there's many species of them I still wish to study. The males of this species fly during the day, they have no functioning mouth and they cannot eat. Therefore they have a short lifespan of only a few days time. They essentially starve in about 3 to 6 days. The males are extremely sensitive to the pheromone of the females and can locate them over long distances. Their antennae are very sensitive and can detect even a single molecule of pheromone. Good news everyone! Good news! Are you a fan of my online web series Moth Cycles? Then I have good news, because I'm going to introduce a brand new feature to it. It's called the Wingspan Board. Each of the squares on this cutting board represent one centimeter. And I figured that a lot of people who are watching my videos, it's hard for them to figure out the skill that the insects are that you're watching on YouTube, you know? It's hard to um, imagine the scale or the size of an insect based of a video footage. So now we have an accurate way to measure them. And in each episode of Moth Cycles, that we raise a moth, from now on, I will add a segment where we check out its wingspans. That's cool, so let's get started. 
Please keep in mind the official wingspan measurement of a moth should be in a spread position with its wings in a 90 degree angle from wingtip to wingtip in the four wings. So what you're looking at right now does not count as an official wingspan measurement. But as you can see the total length of the forewing, well it covers more than one centimeter square, I suppose. So if you would spread its wings, its wingspan would be around two centimeters or maybe a little bit less than that. Maybe like 18 millimeters. Wow, so many males. All my males are coming out right now. The thing is though, I don't really need these males. Why would I pair brothers with their own sisters if I can attract wild males outdoors? In captivity, inbreeding often happens, and this sadly decreases the fitness of the moths. It is much better to pair females with unrelated wild males than their own relatives. So these males will remain single because I prefer to mate them with wild males. I put the females outdoors and they would automatically attract more wild males. It's incredible how sensitive the males are to the presence of a single female. I would put them outdoors and immediately males would come swarming in. This species was really common in my area this year. So I place the females outdoors and I wait. And check out what happens next. It's pretty crazy. They are so ready to mate and drawn in by the pheromones. Cool, huh? Let me show you some more. Wow, if you're a moth, you don't need to install Tinder, unlike me. <coughs> Any single girls watching this right now? Thank you. Now the males of this species do have functional wings and they're so attracted to the females. When I sit here outdoors with my hand open, I bet a male is going to arrive to mate with these females. Just give it some time. None of this is staged. The moths are really just very common in my area. And the presence of one female can drive many males crazy. So if we wait a few minutes, usually the males never fail to arrive. You just have to be a little patient with that. I think I see a male coming. Can you see it? Yeah. He's on my hand. See that? And he's finding one of the females to mate with. This is not stage. He literally came out of nowhere. This is a wild moth. See, that's really fun. In a matter of minutes, we can see how the male has found some of his uh, wives, I suppose. And he's probably picking out a female to mate with. It's pretty cool. Did you know that a moth can, a male can smell a single uh, molecule of female pheromone? A single molecule. That's um, very sensitive. Now let's see up close what the pairing looks like. This is pretty cool, man. I think he's chosen a female to mate with. 
And here I see more of them arriving. Yeah, see that? Here's another male. You can see him flying. He close to my hand. Yep, see that? Attracting wild moths with the females. It's pretty wild. Now, if I keep sitting here, a whole cloud of males is going to arrive. See that? Here comes the third male. Wow, it's pretty cool. And these moths, they come here from a very long distance, actually. Just attracted to the females sitting on my hand. It's crazy. How many do we have? So I think in total we attracted four males. Three of them are on my hand now. Oh, oops, I think I scared one of them away. No problem, it'll come back. That's wonderful. And you can see the males actually mating or attempting to mate. They're pr probably a little bit overwhelmed by the sheer amount of females that they have around them. I mean, I would be too if um, there were so many females around me that wanted to mate with me. Ha ha ha. Very funny, very funny. Thankfully, I'm so ugly that will never happen. No, just kidding. Let's just drop this weird attitude. But yeah, this is fascinating. The males can actually um, locate the females' pheromones over very long distances. And the longer we stand here, the more males we're probably going to attract at some point. So what happens after the females are fertilized then? Laying too many eggs, of course. If these eggs are kept cold, they can hibernate until next spring. But if they are kept warm, they will hatch in about three weeks time on room temperature and you will expect to see many, many, many new babies of the next generation. Rest in peace. Most of the moths are now completely dead. However, they have left behind a rotten hellscape of dead moth corpses and eggs. As you can see here, you can see hundreds and hundreds of eggs. Even more importantly, some of the eggs are actually hatching. So that's why I put leaves in here. And here you can actually see the first generation number two babies growing up that's funny 
Look at that. So these are the babies of the moths that we raised. And um, it looks like there is going to be pretty much an insane amount of babies considering we have an insane amount of eggs. You're talking hundreds and hundreds of eggs. Like wow. This is uh, incredible. Look at that. Here in the background there's just literally hundreds of eggs. Like literally hundreds. Oh dear. Wow. So I'm going to have a lot of moths to take care of. That's not an understatement. Oof. Wow. That's it ladies and gentlemen. The life cycle of this insect is now finished. It is complete. Finito. But the video is not finished yet. Because I think it's very important to educate you about the insects that I show on my channel. Therefore we always have a discussion after the breeding part of moth cycles. In which I educate you and give you a rundown of the species. So let's start that part right now. Let's go. Today we can finally talk about a famous species in Europe. Orgia antica or the vapor moth. This fascinating species deserves to have its own episode on YouTube and today it is finally finished. After months of work, this small but fascinating species is remarkable in several ways and I will explain to you everything there is to know about them. But first, a little bit of a disclaimer. Yes, I am allowed to use copyrighted photos and illustrations for transformative purposes. This video is not monetized and the fair use law allows me to use these materials. The Orange areas is where this species can be found. Interestingly, humans have introduced them in most of these places. The species is native to Europe, Russia and small parts of temperate Asia. However, because of accidental introductions, the species is invasive nowadays in North America, parts of Canada, surprisingly parts of Chile and more. Humans have pretty much distributed these insects accidentally worldwide. Their hibernating eggs and sometimes caterpillars are transported by cargo worldwide by accident and have escaped into the environment forming new populations. In Europe, where the species is originally from, the species is somewhat common. They can survive in a wide range of temperate climates. The habitat of this species is quite diverse, from hedgerows to forest to suburban landscapes and often gardens, as long as there is enough vegetation. They are not really that picky as long as enough woody plants are available to them. The species is generally very hardy and is successful at surviving in a large variety of landscapes. Orgia antica occurs from a single up to partial three generations with moths from June to October in most locations. Usually already the second generation is not quite complete. Larvae occur from May to early September. The wingless females or well not totally wingless but for the sake of language I will just say wingless. The wingless females lay their eggs on the outside of the pupal cocoon where they hibernate. This species is highly adaptable and has a strategy to deal with a wide variety of climates. One way to do this is hibernation. You see the eggs of this moth are capable of hibernating. However the eggs do not always hibernate. In some occasions they can hatch into small baby caterpillars in about three weeks time after being laid by the female. Whether or not the eggs choose to hibernate depends on external factors, or in this case mostly on temperatures. You see in colder circumstances the hatching of the caterpillars will be delayed, 
while in warm circumstances the hatching of the caterpillars will be triggered. Using a fancy word, this is called a facultative diapause. This means that the species is able to take advantage of warmer climates by producing more generations a year, but can also cope with colder environments with short summers by producing just a single brood and then hibernating. This flexibility allows them to survive in a wide range of climates. Another reason this species is so incredibly adaptable is because of their incredibly wide range of host plants. This species can feed on hundreds of types of plants. For a Lepidopteran, this makes them quite a generalist. Some of the most commonly accepted host plants include pine tree or penis, fir tree or abies, maple tree or acer, hawthorn or crategus, cherry or prunus, lime or tilia, oak tree or quercus, bramble or rubus, willow or salix, blueberry or vaccinium, birch or betula, hazel or ulnus, heather or Caluna vulgaris, hop or humulus lupulus, apple or malus, poplar or populus, ash tree or vaccinus, elder buckthorn or frangula ulnus, dandelion or taxaracum, and many, many more. Once again, this adaptation allows them to be flexible with their environment. These moths are diurnal, which means that they are active during the day. That's why I was able to attract so many males in my video in broad daylight. During the day, they patrol the area, looking for the scent of females. The female of this species barely has any wings at all. Her wings are vestigial, and they have been reduced to stumps. Technically, they are not wingless. They do have wings. The wings are just very, very small. Females spend most of their life sitting on top of their cocoons, waiting for males to arrive. The cocoons is also where they will lay their eggs eventually. Brachypterism, or more frequently brachypteri, is an anatomical condition in which an animal has very reduced wings. Such animals or their wings may be described as brachypterous. Brachypterous wings generally are not functional as organs of flight and often seem to be totally functionless and vestigial. In moths, this phenomenon looks unusual because in our mind we are used to the mental image of moths having functioning wings. However, in reality, there's examples of brachypteri in numerous families of moths. Even large ones, such as Lacio campidae or leopard moths, and even a number of Saturnidae females or emperor moths. Geometrid moths or loopers, Arctinae or tiger moths, and many, many more families. Amazingly, it even happens in some species of butterflies. In several species in the butterfly genus Redonda, females do have wings but they are so small that she is unable to effectively fly. Essentially, all her life she thinks she can simply crawl around on the floor, while males fly around trying to locate her. It may blow your mind to imagine butterflies that have lost their ability to fly, but it exists. It's not that surprising if you think about how often it happens in over 35 families of Lepidopterans. Why? Why are some females of butterflies and moths reduced to a walking abdomen? It's simply an evolutionary trade-off between flight capability and reproduction. First of all, having functional wings and a muscle mass to support these wings in flight costs energy. In fact, having any bodily function or organ at all in the first place costs energy. The absence of wings simply allows greater allocation of resources to egg production. But we have to ask ourselves, in potentially what circumstances is laying more eggs an advantage over being able to fly? The answer to that is a habitat in which you don't need to disperse. That's right, it's not just resource allocation, but also habitat persistence is one of the important factors that make brachypteri an adaptive advantage. In stable habitats where the species can reproduce 
without an urgent need for dispersal, there is less selective pressure when it comes to functional wings in females. In a very stable habitat, there is less incentive for them to cover larger distances or migrate, sacrificing flight capability for a higher reproductive rate. And better resource allocation towards egg laying may make more sense in these cases. Worldwide, there are quite a lot of species of vapor moths. There is a chance that if you live in the USA or Europe, you have seen some of them. The moths are small and often overlooked, but they really do have wonderful looking caterpillars. Here is a challenge for you. If you ever find some of them, try and raise them in captivity and see what happens. Some species are really common, but others are pretty rare and rarely studied by biologists. I'm a fan of these creatures myself. I should add, be careful with exotic species. They can be invasives. Try raising native species only. Second of all, the caterpillars in some instances can cause rashes and skin irritations. So take precautions and avoid them if you have any allergies. Otherwise, have fun studying these wonderful animals. And now we will display the credits, displaying the names of my loyal patrons on Patreon. Hey, what's up? I hope you enjoyed this episode. I worked long and hard on it. Uh, I really wanted to show people this very cute little uh, vapor moth that's very common in my garden, as you can see. As soon as I put the females out there, the males almost instantly arrived. That was, to me, a crazy moment to see how fast these moths can respond to the pheromone to the females. However, I'm also here to give you guys an announcement. One announcement that uh, most of you are aware of. But my YouTube channel is demonetized. YouTube does not support my channel. What does that mean? Ah. Normally, when YouTubers are successful on this website, they become a YouTube partner. And that means when people click on your videos, uh, people subscribe to your channel and you get a lot of views, you will get paid by YouTube, right? But for me, this is not true. YouTube does not pay me and my channel is permanently demonetized. Now, I have often wondered what did I do wrong? What did I do to deserve such a punishment or treatment from YouTube? And I've actually emailed them once to ask them, why did you demonetize my channel? What did I do wrong to deserve this? And many years ago, this was their official response. Hi Bart, thanks for the response. I appreciate your understanding. Unfortunately, I'm unable to provide advice for your channel. You may check on, I'd recommend visiting our YouTube Creator Academy page for more information. Lastly, we cannot provide you specific details on what guideline your content has violated. Let me know if you have other questions regards Bernard, the YouTube support team. Let me quote this again. We cannot provide you specific details on what guideline my content has violated. So YouTube has effectively punished me for breaking some kind of guideline, but they refuse to tell me why or what it is that I did wrong. YouTube is not transparent. For me, this is bad because I put so much time and effort in this channel. And to me, that's really a problem, you know? It's so difficult to entertain over 20,000 subscribers on this channel and not make an income. I am not a YouTuber to get rich, to become famous. But the truth is that we live in a capitalist world and I am putting time and resources in this channel that I am not getting back from YouTube. And that is a problem. And that may threaten the existence of my channel. However, I had a brilliant idea and that is crowdfunding. This website, this YouTube series is crowdfunded. I am 100% dependent on the tips and donations of my viewers. I have a crowdfunding platform that is called Patreon. It's also possible to contribute through PayPal, LiberaPay, Ko-Fi and other uh, options that are available in the description of this video. 
You can read the description below this video and you will see links and ways to help. Therefore, I have to remind all my viewers, if you like the show, if you like my videos, consider contributing to it financially through donations. I apologize for the internet begging. I don't like to do it. I wish I didn't have to. But there is no company sponsoring me. YouTube is not helping me. I'm just one guy with a camera doing all of this by himself. And it's only thanks to the generous donations of my viewers today and in the past that this channel is still going and still growing bigger. So if you like the channel, consider supporting us on Patreon or any of the other platforms I just mentioned. And in return, you will receive benefits and rewards such as stickers, merchandise, or special episodes, depending on the platform that you use. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye-bye.
Thank you for watching the show and thank you for donating. Without all of you, this video would not be here today. Hey, by the way, do you see this stuff? This is merchandise. Stickers, posters, mugs and more things that I made myself. People who subscribe to my Patreon are eligible to receive gifts and merchandise. And in return, you are supporting one of the only independent entomologists on YouTube. That's a cause worth supporting if you ask me. See you later. Bye bye.